Hey everyone, Blake here. And I have uh, moved on to the fifth level of our uh, slowly building up uh, scenario for Unity Machine Learning. Um, in this case, I actually got a suggestion from uh, RoboSerg TV. Um, thank you very much. He was watching what we were doing and says, hey, you should try a Moonlander game. Um, that isn't exactly where I was going with this project. However, that is really kind of closely along the next few steps and it's not really much of a branch so actually that's a, a great way to keep this going without having to go all the way to the end so it's it's a really good kind of intermediate point uh to work towards so we're going to be working towards kind of a moonlander game for now and then you know we're going to grow beyond that and move on to other things so what i did with uh <clears throat> the fifth scenario here keep in mind I'm still on Unity ML Agents version 2. I think this weekend I'm going to spend some time and upgrade to version 3. I know, I'm a little late to the game on that, um, but I've been progressing so well with this, I don't really want to mess with it too much, but I think I'm going to do that uh, this coming weekend. Um, so, what we've done is... Uh, I'll open up a scene tab here. All right. And so you can see... Sorry, ultra huge monitor taking over everything. Um, we have our marker as usual, and we have our target, and the position of the target still moves around, but now directly under the target, there is a platform. This platform is something that your marker can crash into or it can land on, depending on its relative velocity. So if there is a physics collision, if the velocity is under a certain amount, it's considered a landing and everything's okay and if it's over a certain amount then it's considered a crash and the game resets so I'm gonna open that up so you can see marker target floor the brain and the Academy remain unchanged except for the brain now has a third piece of state information which is the distance to the floor and then the game creator is just using the prefab that has the floor and some of these new behaviors the floor is pretty much just a cube, it has a mesh renderer, and then it has a very simple script. This script references the agent, and this script also has the logic for the physics, because this is where the collision happens. This this has the collider, and so this has the on-collision event. Uh, I guess in theory, you could have that collision information on the cube, but you know, it may be in the future that the cube can collide with a bunch of different things, and so I don't want to have a bunch of if statements in the cube about if it's this, do this, if it's that, it's that, you know, do that. I'd rather have all of the logic of the cube be with what it's colliding with so that, you know, when the cube collides with the floor, since the cube is the only thing that can collide with the floor, that the logic is there in the floor and it says, hey, here's what you do when the cube collides with it. Um, I do have a little bit of logic in here. Uh, to also determine that it's your own cube as opposed to another game's cube, although that isn't a problem yet. So let's take a look at the agent and highlight some of the differences. And actually, before we do that, why don't we play this game? We'll do that real quick. So you can see me play it. Here we go. So I'm controlling it, and I only have a binary on off. And so I want to slow down, and then boom, I can land on top of the target, if I do so gently. If I come in too fast and crash into it, boom, the game will reset. Boom. And the other thing I did is I made sure I set the start point, the spawn point, always at such a height that if you do nothing, you cannot land it, right? So you have to do something in order to successfully land your ship on that target. So... That's all there is to it. Okay, so in the gravity game with obstacle, right, we have the marker, the target, and the floor. So these are just references for internally to our code. We have the starting height minimum and starting height max. So these are a little different than the previous games we've done. But again, same idea applies. So we start from uh, half a meter above the marker to up to two meters above the marker. Um, the floor offset, originally I had the floor move up and down a little bit, 
um, in relation to the bottom marker, but I realized for Moonlander you don't really want to do that. Really, you want to have the ground be right under the marker, so these aren't actually doing anything that's just holding it steady at 0.15. Um, the up force, that again is how much force is applied when a full on signal is given to the uh, Y acceleration. The minimum reward distance, that's how uh, close do you need to be in order to start getting a reward uh, or, or the most reward. Uh, the max reward distance is 2 meters, so how far away can you be to get something of a reward? <coughs> this is the level of reward you get, so 0 0.1 is uh, how many points you get every frame if you're within this 0.1. And then on collision points, this is what is the penalty if you crash with the ground? And this is one of the things that I really wanted to toy with here to understand what the different values for this, how does that affect training, right? If we start adding penalties, what do penalties really do to the behavior of the training? And I have some very interesting results, which we will go into. I'll show you the tensor board for that. And then here's the collision velocity threshold. So basically, if you come in with an overall magnitude relative velocity uh, greater than three, then it's considered a crash. Um, and you can toy with that. You can bring it down. You can bring it up. Uh, but in this case, um, three happened to be uh, a happy place for it. Now, we'll go into the agent's code. And so we'll go ahead and the start, we just get the rigid body, that's the same. Um, we reset, when, when the game resets, we reset the velocity rotation and angular velocity. And then the target transform position, in this case, I've changed it so that the target is always at the center of the game. And this is one where I should probably run some experiments where I play around with this a little bit more so that the game doesn't just come up with a single answer and keep reusing that. Sometimes I wonder if that's what's happening because this target location is always the same. However, that said, the, um, and the floor position is always the same in relation to the target, the marker does randomly go between, again, a half a meter above that target or two meters above the target. So it's not really the same um, all the time, right? So every game is a little bit different. And does it make much of a difference if the target moves or the marker moves, considering that we're giving all of the observations in relation to each other? It actually probably doesn't make much of a difference because um, all of the inputs we're giving it are relative anyway, so it may not actually make much of a difference at all. And again, this is the same visualization code that we used uh, a video or so ago, so we're not gonna go into that. For collecting the state, um, again, we now have three inputs to the ML system, the distance to the target, its current velocity, and the distance to the floor. We don't tell it what the threshold for crashing is. I thought about this, but I figured in the actual Moonlander games when you're playing it, you don't really know what the velocity threshold is, so I didn't include it here. The computer's kind of got to figure that out, and it turns out it's able to figure that, no problem. Um, in the agent step, what is it doing every agent? Um, you know, if it has a possible action, then we bound that possible action and apply it, right? How much force are we adding to the thruster? Again, when I as a player am playing it, I'm doing it with the keyboard, and so I have on or off. Um, if I was using a uh, joystick, then I could have uh, a variable input. Um, but it's fine to have just a discrete input for this game so far. Um, reward, okay, so again, we're calculating the reward. And then we have this if statement. If a collision has happened, then we overwrite whatever this reward is and we give it on collision points, right? So that it can be the negative one as we had. I started with negative 10, right? Because I wanted to have a really strong signal that says, hey, really don't do this. Um, and that worked. 
<laughs> and we'll again we'll go into that a little bit more. So here's so here's what we do, right? We say, all right, if there is a collision, then we we apply this penalty, and then we say this done is true, which means the game is over. Calculate reward is, I believe, identical to the end of the last video. And then this public collision happened. That's just so that the floor can send a message to the agent to say, hey, there's been a collision. So I will also show you that code real quick. So we'll go to the floor and the floor script on here. Again, not much in this beastie. This is the agent, again, because the agent kind of controls all of the action within the game. And then on collision, enter, you know, this is a standard Unity collision. What if I collided with my marker and the relative velocity magnitude is greater than the collision threshold, then you say a collision happened. Otherwise, you don't do anything. That's it. So just if it came in too hot, then you mark it as a collision. Otherwise, you leave it alone and no big deal. So let's see here. That's pretty much everything. And I showed you me playing this as a single game. And what's actually kind of fun about this, um, we'll fire it up. We're playing, we're having the computer play 20 games at a time. Turns out I can also play 20 games at a time, kind of, sorta. There you go. Oh, no, not quite. Um, but you'll see that I'll, I'll try to land, and I've, I have successfully done it, um, land all 20 of these as I play my game. Um, got very close. Is possible. But generally speaking, again, you know, does this do what we think it should? And it, you know, it's playing and seems to be bug free. So I took that and again, I started with this negative 10 uh, penalty. And I said, all right, game, go train. And here are the results that I got with that. And it did train. It took a little longer than I thought it should. Um, I was concerned about that. And we'll see here, so the two curves that are the most interesting is the cumulative reward and the episode length. So I'm going to make this a bit bigger so you can see what's going on. So here's the cumulative reward. So it started off really negative, and then it flattened out. It figured out how not to crash. And it, it really thought, man, not crashing is really, really beneficial. That negative 10 reward is, is super harsh. And no matter what I'm going to do, oh, I got some smoothing on. I'm going to turn that off. Right, so right away, it just got like, yeah, don't crash, right? And no matter what I do, I'm not going to crash. And so it played very, very, very conservatively, trying not to crash. No matter what, it knew that it didn't want to crash. Over a fair amount of time, it finally realized that it could get a better score, and then it jumped up. It took it until... Uh, where are we, 125,000 steps or so before it was able to find that, right? And then it was able to maximize its score. And I knew, again, based on the previous videos that we've done, um, the, you know, my estimated maximum score was about 22, and that's why I had this negative 10, right? This really strong, uh, you know, proverbial slap in the face. is like, do not do that. Um, and I'll show you the episode length so again, what it learned, let me get that to scale here. There we go. Um, again, right off the bat, almost immediately at you know the first 5,000 steps, it learned, don't crash, right? There's this huge penalty for crashing. I'm not going to crash. And that's exactly what it learned. And then it was dead solid at 250 steps, and that's the maximum number of steps, right? So it wasn't crashing. It did everything it could possibly do to avoid crashing. Again, until we get into that 125-ish thousand uh, range, where now it starts experimenting a little more, and then it crashes every now and then, so the episode length um, you know, goes up and down a little bit. But when I was watching the training, this this graph, watching this graph do its thing, and especially when it's sitting here in this dead zone, I'm like, oh man, I made that way too big. The penalty is just too darn huge, and there's no way that it's gonna figure out the rest of it. And it eventually did. So um, you know, big props to PPO for being this kind of self-balancing. Uh, uh, algorithm where over time, if it notices things are too stagnant, it will encourage the algorithm to explore more. Um, so we're able to do that. 
But I still saw this huge dead zone, and I'm like, you know what? I think my penalty was too big. Let me try to uh, reduce the penalty, see what happens. And so I did. So I reduced it to negative five. And so here is the new curve. And so immediately we see this, this system trained <clears throat> and really around, you know, step 50,000, it has figured out where the sweet spot is. And because that this allows the system to explore more, right? That penalty wasn't so overwhelmingly powerful that it was able to explore more freely. So you can see much more quickly, it was able to learn and explore. And uh, in the end, we got a very similar result, but you know, my training times didn't have to be anywhere near this long, right? I, you know, this is just the default settings that I've been using. And again, it was able to figure things out very early on. Um, the episode length, again, uh, actually a fairly similar curve, like right off the bat, it said, oh, whoa, I can't be crashing. Negative five is really powerful. And then, you know, again, completely flat. And then it finally decides to explore some more. And you can see that there's some more jaggedness going on. Now, there's another trick to this, is the penalty that I impose on it is this flat negative 5 or flat negative 10, whatever it is. And then I realize there is a second penalty that's happening, and that is because the game is ending earlier, you know, we have this long trail of uh, score values, right, up to 2 meters, and so by ending early, even if it's not accumulating the maximum possible score, it's not accumulating, you know, 50 frames or 100 frames worth of those little scores, and that does add up. And so even just the episode length itself um, may, you know, a lower episode length means that you will have a lower score. And so in some ways, I was kind of double penalizing the system, right? once with this big negative score and then again the penalty for having a shorter episode length means it has a lower possible maximum score so i said all right uh why don't i try again and this time i'm gonna dial it all the way down i'm gonna dial it to a negative two penalty and here's the curve i get so again it learned super fast Right, I spent all this time training here for this negative 10 penalty, and that was a waste of time. Right, so these penalties, negative two penalty is enough that just right off the bat, boom, it feels safe in exploring. Now notice that these curves are smoother, and I'll go ahead and turn off these just because it's a little noisy and you'll see, but at no point in time did this refuse to crash. Now, we ended up in about the same spot, but actually this behavior is a bit different because since it's never refusing to crash, it never gets stuck in this mindset of, you know, whoa, I won't explore there because it's too dangerous. So with this negative two penalty, a much milder penalty, it's still willing to explore the space, and that's very important. And the same is true for a negative one penalty as well. The negative one penalty and the negative two penalty graphs are almost identical. So I think we've, you know, hit the point where it doesn't really matter that much. Um, again, so I kept, you know, running this over and over again to see what kind of different results I got. And it was, you know, very uh, interesting to me that the penalty values really don't need to be that big, right? You don't need to hit it over the hammer and said, you should never do this thing. Because as it optimizes itself, as it tries to figure out the way to get the highest possible score, it's going to find those one point, two point penalties, and it'll figure out as best it can how to avoid those one point or two point penalties. So I would say, you know, having done this, the real lesson is start with a smaller penalty if you're not sure. Um, even if you are sure, um, you know, always start with the minimum possible penalty that you think will be effective and experiment with it because um, certainly I didn't expect a, a penalty of negative one to be very effective, um, but it certainly was. Again, you know, in under 25,000 iterations or so, I think. Oh, no. 
mm, yeah, about 25,000 iter iterations, this was pretty much trained. And then the other 475,000 iterations were just perfecting its technique. Now, of course, the question is, is it as good? Is one as good as the other? Um, and again, we can see that well, the final score says it should be. And so we come back in here and we say, all right, well, let's compare it at least visually. So we have some empirical data, some objective data that says, yes, this should be as good. And let's bring it back into our game. So we'll go back to our brain, switch this over to internal, and we'll drop in our negative 10 penalty and smooth as silk. These guys just come in for a perfect landing, super smooth every time. Couldn't be prettier. Look at that. And um, that's great. So then let's try the negative one penalty. And sure enough, it acts identically. So <clears throat> our charts aren't lying. Um, numbers aren't lying. Seems to work uh, ideally and I'm very happy with it. So again, keep your penalty small. Uh, you know, take this as a, take this as a lesson learned um, for me. Uh, take my mistakes and go forth and and use them to your own advantage. Certainly. Um, and so the next thing that I want to do, I think, is um, we're going to move this to uh, two dimensional movement. So instead of having a single rocket, these are going to have two rockets, a left and a right. And so that's going to provide some steering, uh, so the, the, they'll be able to move back and forth like this a bit. Um, so that's going to be interesting. And then uh, probably going to add fuel as a limiting factor, um, where I believe in some of the original Moonlander games, the more fuel you had at the end, the better your score was, right? So you wanted to get there. Um, it's not necessarily about uh, how... Uh, quickly you got there, but how uh, fuel efficient you were when you got there. So that's something we'll be uh, toying around with and trying to figure out how do we get that kind of thing uh, into this kind of problem um, because there's certainly, uh, you know, having the current landing value gradient that we have is clearly working very well. And so how do we uh, kind of move the moon lander into that um you know, uh, uh, reward structure. So there we go. As usual, if you have any questions or thoughts, please let me know. This code will be going up on GitHub momentarily. If um, you have any tips or suggestions to upgrading to ML Agents 0.3, I'd also like to hear those in the comments, especially if you can get them to me before this weekend uh, when I'll be doing this, because uh, if anybody knows any gotchas, because uh, there's always something. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very eager to hear it. So thank you all very much and have fun out there.